My name is Margot Landman. I'm Senior Director for Education Programs at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you here. We are very fortunate to have this space at Dorsey & Whitney, courtesy of one of our board members, Nelson Dong, who is based in the Seattle office, but has very graciously worked with his New York colleagues to allow us to use this room. It is my pleasure to introduce Michelle Loyalka, who gave me a tutorial in pronouncing her name, and I hope I did okay. Um, you have her bio, so I will not waste time going over what you already have. But I will tell you something that's not on the bio, and that is that she's from La Crosse, Wisconsin, which is of interest to us at the National Committee because we've been working with the School District of La Crosse for years on Chinese language instruction in their schools. She is not a product of that, but was very <laughs> interested to hear about it. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to you. We very much look forward to the program, and it's a great book. I encourage everybody to get a copy. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here today, and thank you so much for inviting me here to have the opportunity. Um, as as you can tell from the title of the book, this is a book about the massive movement of people from China's countryside into its urban areas. And um, currently there's about 200 million migrants in the cities at any given time. And this number is expected to grow to about 300 million people uh, over the next 20 years. And so that makes this the largest and one of the fastest movements of people in human history, and it's really having a tremendous impact on Chinese society, both uh, in terms of values and lifestyles and culture, and uh, also in terms of um, creating sort of social unrest and upheaval and sort of discontent. And so it's really emerging in China as one of the key issues that the government is facing in the coming years and on into the coming decades. So what I'd like to do tonight is just start with a little look at uh, what is happening in terms of migration and urbanization in China. So if we look, uh, Western countries generally made this transition from being primarily rural to being primarily urban societies. It took about 200 years in the West. But China is on track to make this transition within about 50 years. Also in the 30 years since China's reform started, uh, its urban population has doubled, and over the next 30 years it's expected to double yet again. Now currently Europe has 35 cities with more than 1 million people. China right now has 160 cities with more than a million people. Uh, and by 2025, China is expected to have, does anybody know how many it's supposed to have by 2025? So from 160 to 221 cities with more than a million people. So just in the next uh, little more than 10 years, we're talking about another 80 cities added with more than a million people. And so among these 221 cities, there's estimated to be 15 super cities, each with 25 million or more people. And so by comparison, the entire state of Texas has about 25 million people. So we're talking about 15 cities in China, each as populous as the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. And by 2030, China's urban population will reach 1 billion people. And so this will make urban China more populous than the entire North and South American continents combined. And so clearly this is sort of a, a very large scale and very rapid movement of people. And it, there's many sort of forces pushing this along. But there's one group of people that I think you could really call the unsung hero sort of underlying China's uh, dramatic turnaround. And given the topic of the book, I'm sure you can guess that is its population of rural migrants. So again, there's currently around 200 million migrants in the cities at any given time, and that number is expected to jump to about 300 million in the next 20 years. Now, in the West, I think people generally tend to think of China's migrants as being uh, factory workers. You know, most of the world's clothes and socks and electronics are all put together in factories largely manned by uh, migrant workers in China. 
But、um, actually, of the 200 million migrants that are in China's cities,、uh, only about a third of them work in factories. So the other two thirds are intimately involved in China's own domestic life, building up the cities, helping the urbanization process to happen.、Uh, so just to give an example of some of the things they do, over the next 20 years, rural migrants will help to build about five million new buildings. This will include 10,000. Skyscrapers, or the、uh, I'm sorry, 50,000 skyscrapers, which is the equivalent of 10 New York cities.、Uh, they'll also help to pave five billion square meters of roads. And in cities around the country, they come in and they often they snap up sort of the low-level, low-paying, distasteful jobs that urbanites are not really so interested in. And they also carve out for themselves all manner of small-time entrepreneurial activities. So, for example, they may haul heavy loads. They might repair bicycles or other things,、uh, sell produce on street corners. The man at the top here is popping popcorn on a street corner. So there's, you know, all kinds of different things that they do, and they they tend to be really light on their feet and able to sort of continually remold themselves to meet the changing needs of the Chinese economy. And because of this,、um, they're really essential to urban life. I, as I was doing interviews for the book, I met a lot of people who, in the course of just a year or two, had sort of seamlessly shifted gears many times over. So you know, one woman had gone from. Selling eggs on the corner to selling produce to shining shoes to opening a sheet shop and to me I felt you know that's mind-boggling how many different professions she had in such a short time but for her she said you know this is the way you do things when you don't have a lot of other choices and so these migrants really become、uh, pivotal in Chinese cities and so what I want to do tonight is sort of look at who these migrants are. Uh, what are some of the forces driving them to the cities? What are the contributions they make and the difficulties that they face? But I thought I'd first start out with a little bit of background about how I became interested in this topic. So,、uh, when I came to China in 1995, I、uh, 97, sorry, I had that opportunity to work with an educational research organization, and we made a curriculum that was used、um, in smaller townships around Guangdong Province, and.、Um, So I would go and visit these schools about once a month, and in one of the schools, the principal invited me to stay for an extra day and go back with her to her、uh, relative's village, which was nearby. And so this was my first opportunity to go to the countryside in China. So I was, you know, really excited to do that. And this was a banana farming village in the mountains, and we spent the day hiking and eating fruit off the trees. And anyone who's been in urban China, you probably can imagine that after a year and a half in a, in a very urbanized place,、uh, this was like heaven for me. And so,、um, at the end of the the day, we were sitting with her relatives in their home, and they asked me, "How did you like our village?" And I said, "Oh, I love it here. You know, it's it's so fantastic." And they said, "If you love it here, you should move here." And so, you know. Looking back, I don't think I probably at that point realized that maybe they weren't being sincerely inviting me so much as they were being <laughs> polite. <laughs> But I said in my enthusiasm, I said, "Okay, I would love to." And so I think they were surprised, but they were also very accommodating. So here I am in the village with some of the local kids outside of my house, and、um, this was a really a, a, a great experience for me in, in many ways, and a very interesting experience. I mean, it was the first time there had ever been foreigners in this village, and、um, Especially the first time a foreign person had lived in this village, and so I became something of a local tourist attraction. I mean, people would, from the nearby villages would hear that I was living there, and they wanted to verify this, and they would walk. One, one night even came from 20 kilometers away on foot to, to verify whether or not there was really a foreigner living there, and, and they would stand outside my window and kind of peer in and have this. Ongoing conversation. There happened to be bars on the window, so they would kind of peer in and watch and have this ongoing conversation about. What they were seeing, and so it was kind of like living in the zoo. But、um, but it was really a wonderful experience. The people were extremely hospitable、um, and pure-hearted, and it really was sort of a key experience in terms of helping me to start thinking about China's development from the point of view of the rural population. Because so many times you kind of see it from the urban perspective and from the the boom towns, you see that oftentimes. But this was a, a very different experience, and I started to really think about what does the development mean for these people. This is another picture. The village was called the Flower Fruit Village, and from there I moved to Xi'an, which、uh, is the ancient capital of China,、uh, most well known in the West probably for being、uh, the home of the terracotta soldiers. 
And it's also um, a major city in Western China, although on the map you can see it's actually geographically the center of China, but that's everywhere from there westward is all considered Western China. And um, so when China started to, to develop, uh, to have its reform policies 30 years ago, they had the concept that they would first allow a small portion of the population to become prosperous and that those people would sort of pull everybody else up to prosperity. And so Eastern China, the, the sort of crescent along the, the seaboard there, was chosen to sort of lead everybody else to prosperity. And Western China was sort of um, ignored, sort of left a language behind. And so I moved to Xi'an in 1999. And in the beginning of 2000, China started what was called the Go West policy, or the, the great opening of the West policy, which is essentially designed to help Western China quickly catch up with the rest of the country. And so Xi'an was sort of the focal point of that uh, movement. And within Xi'an, the high-tech zone was sort of the focal point of the focal point, if you will. And so um, when the Chinese government decides to do things, sometimes it happens very quickly. And so within a matter of months, investment money really came pouring into this area and new urban high-rises were just uh, going up everywhere. And so I was living in this area and from my apartment at uh, any given time when you would look out the window you would see 10 to 20 cranes on the horizon putting up new, new urban developments. But what I could also see from my window, and in fact it was basically directly behind the housing complex where I lived in the high-tech zone, was this old village of Ganjajai. And um, Ganjajai is actually the, the village whose farmland, the high tech zone, was built on. So what often happens in China is as the cities expand, the city governments will buy up the, the farmland, but they don't buy up the cluster of village homes. So generally villages are constructed so that the homes are clustered together. And so they buy up the farmland, but not that cluster of village homes. And so the farmers who lose their land in this process, they take the money that they get as a payout for their land and they use that to build onto their houses. Uh, sometimes they tear them down and sort of start over so they can utilize every available inch. And then they rent out their home room by room to the rural migrants who rush into the area looking for jobs in these new developing urban areas. And so this is actually an extremely common phenomenon in Chinese cities, so common that there's a, a term for it, which is city village, or sometimes you hear them called urban villages. And um, these are really pivotal in, in, in China in terms of giving migrants a low-cost housing option. And uh, in that village of Ganjajai, when I was there originally, it was home to about 1,500 farmers. And when I was there, they estimated there was about 30,000 rural migrants. And this is about a six block area. So it's extremely densely populated. Um, lots of social problems ensue, as you can imagine. But um, so in 2004, I went back to grad school for uh, journalism. And when I graduated, I got a fellowship, which gave me funding to work on a book length project. And um, I knew I wanted to write about all of this transformation that I had witnessed in China. And so I came back to the same neighborhood that I had lived in before. And what I found is that Ganja Jai was about to be demolished. And um, everybody that I interacted with regularly, the, the vegetable vendors or the people who cut hair, the people working in restaurants, they were all very sort of upset and anxious about this because they lived in, in, in this village and there weren't many of these city villages left. They'd already mostly been torn down. And so they weren't sure how could they support their life in the city anymore after this village was gone. And so that's, I think, when it really clicked for me, you know, that these migrants are so essential to helping uh, develop the urban areas and urban life really depends so much on them. And yet um, the migrants themselves are sort of relegated to the outskirts of society and, and um, really not able to sort of enjoy the fruits of their labor, if you will. And so this became the backdrop, basically, for the book. So the book uh, has profiles of eight different migrants who uh, work mostly in this high-tech zone, although not as high-tech workers, and um, they live in this old village of Ganjajai. And the book tries to chronicle how successfully, or in some cases unsuccessfully, they're able to sort of navigate between these two very different universes in which they live. And the other thing that I really try to capture in the book is that the spirit that the people bring. And so I think a lot of times, um, in my experience, when I've seen Western media talking about uh, rural people in China and about migrants, 
I feel oftentimes it's sort of the, the storyline is that they're uh, you know, downtrodden victims of oppression. But that wasn't my experience, and I don't think that that's how migrants view their own reality. I think that um, they tend to be very full of life and vigor, and given their circumstances, I think they're relatively optimistic and upbeat, and um, very entrepreneurial and, and um, enterprising. And um, in Chinese, there's this great word, churku, which essentially, there's not a, a direct translation in English, but essentially it means to... Uh, persevere and to endure difficulties and to just keep moving ahead despite what problems you may have. And uh, so in English, for lack of a better translation, if we look at it, if we just translate it directly, it's eating bitterness. And so that's where the title of the book comes from. And I didn't actually set out with this as a theme in mind when I, when I started to interview people, but the migrants that I had talked with themselves, they brought this up over and over again as sort of being the key to their ability to survive in the cities for so long with, given the, the difficulties that they had. And um, so it really emerged sort of as a theme in every chapter. You kind of see all the different ways that people have to change and grow and develop and sort of switch gears in order to maintain a place for themselves in such a rapidly changing society. Um, so now I would like to look at a little bit at who are China's rural migrants. So I think oftentimes people assume they're the lowest level of society, but that's generally not the case. Over time, migrants are becoming um, increasingly younger and more well-educated. So last year in 2011, 70% of migrants were under age 30, and 65% uh, had finished middle school, 12% had finished high school. Um, now, why do they come to the cities? The, the kind of most obvious answer is that China has this large income gap. So there's both an income gap in terms of uh, rural urban income and also in terms of east-west. So um, urban income is about three and a half times higher than rural income, and um, eastern income is about one and a half times more than western income. To put this in another perspective, in Beijing, I what I pay for my apartment um, for one month's rent, and it's just a very average apartment, <laughs> uh, what I pay for one month's rent in Beijing is more than a farmer in Western China will make in an entire year. So that's you know, a significant driver sending people to the cities uh, to look for more opportunity. And related to this is an issue of a lack of land. So in China, when collectivized agriculture ended um, in the late 70s and early 80s, essentially what happened is every village sort of divvied up their farmland and allocated it to um, the, the farmers who lived there. And this is generally still in place today. So if you're born as a rural resident in China, you receive a parcel of land. Um, it's, it's, it's not, you don't own it exactly, you're not allowed to sell it. If uh, you let it go fallow, you'll lose it. And when you die, it will go back to the village to be redistributed to the next generation. But otherwise, it's essentially yours for life. And so this is seen in China um, as really a, a key form of social security for the rural people. And, and they really do treasure this piece of land. It's sort of their, their retirement plan, their fallback option. Um, the problem, though, comes in is that by the time you divvy up all the arable land in China among 700 million or so rural residents, uh, each person only receives about a sixth of an acre. So, you know, that's... It's a very small amount of land, and even if you assume a, a family of four, it's still about 673 times smaller than the average American farm. So obviously when you're talking about um, such small amounts of land that, that, that farmers have, it's re farming is really not a viable livelihood in China. It's really a sustenance insurance plan. It's enough to make sure that you can keep your family fed. But families who want to do more than just keep themselves fed typically need to send somebody to the city uh, for work. Uh, next thing I'd like to look at is what contributions migrants make. So already I, I've sort of talked about the contributions they make in building up uh, China cities, doing the service jobs in the cities. And there's another contribution that uh, I think is really important that has to do with the fact that in China migration is generally not a one-time event. And so it's generally a circular migration pattern. People may come to the cities for a year or two or three but then they'll typically re return back to their villages because, again, they have land there. Oftentimes they've left their children there. They have parents there. So they have a tie back to the villages. And they'll maybe go back home for a year or two and then come back out again. And so many people in the course of their life will migrate 
four or five times. It's, it's very common. And so um, the, the result of this is that every time migrants end up going back to their villages, they go back with new life experiences, new insights, new skills. And then they're really sort of um, responsible largely for developing the rural areas because of that. They often are the ones who will start local enterprises back in their villages or nearby towns. And so, uh, you know, migrants, they're really pivotal to building up China's urban society, but also they're equally sort of essential for developing the rural area. So they're, they're really sort of um, on both sides, they're, they're really fundamental. And now I'd like to talk about a few of the difficulties they face, and there's a lot of them, so I'll, I'll just kind of go over them quickly. But um, first, they tend to be overworked. 80% uh, will work seven days a week. Um, you know, nine, 12, 14, 16 hour days are very common. Uh, they also tend to be underpaid. And this was actually uh, a, a big news uh, in China a couple of years ago that migrant salaries had risen pretty rapidly and were within about um, 20 to 30 US dollars of a college graduate starting salary. And so what happened is when people started to hear this, when, when the salary rose, a lot of middle school students in uh, seventh and eighth grade started to drop out of school because you know, they said, oh, wow, we can, make, we can make what a college grad can make, whatever we, we don't need school. And so um, obviously, though, a college graduate salary is going to rise much more steeply, and um, a college graduate's not working seven days a week, 12, 14, 16 hour days. And so if you look hour, you know, per hour, migrants still are, are quite underpaid. Um, next, the living conditions. So again, these city villages, often they're extremely overcrowded. Um, the building kind of happens in a haphazard way oftentimes, and so um, they, and also migrants, they live in very small spaces, about eight square meters on average, which is essentially a bed with a little walkway around it. So, um, and, 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 the, and these uh, city villages have a lot of crime and social problems because the, the population there is so transient. Also in terms of social conditions, migrants are often separated from their families. Um, there's sort of a social stigma that they're of lower quality than urbanites. And um, I think, I don't hear it talked about too often, but I think psychologically, you know, it's very difficult to be living in the midst of this new, very glamorous sort of city, and yet feel like you have no part of it. You're sort of an outsider, although you're right there sort of involved in, in developing it. And so psychologically, I think that's also a, a, a big problem. Now, the last one I want to talk about briefly, because it's, it's a big topic, is uh, China's hukou system, or its uh, household registration system. And China has really had some version of this on and off for the last 2,000 years. But the most recent reincarnation came in the late 50s, instituted by Mao as a means to keep the rural population from fleeing the rural areas when collectivized agriculture began. And um, at that, so at that time, it was really used to prevent movement. It's not used for that anymore. But what it is used to do is to allocate benefits. So everyone is entitled to things like um, subsidized health care or um, free education for their kids. But you're only entitled to these things in the place where you're registered. So um, I should mention that the way you receive your registration, it's based on not on where you're born, but on where your parents are registered, because otherwise everyone would just go to Beijing <laughs> to have their kids. So um, wherever your parents are registered, then you, you become also registered in that location. And it's once you're labeled as a rural person, it's very hard to ever change that registration. The only sort of clear and easy way to do it is to go to college. So if you go to college, it's really pretty easy usually to change your registration, become an official urbanite, and sort of seamlessly integrate into society. But um, in the rural areas, less than 25% of people are going to have the opportunity to go to college. So most people, once you're born as a farmer, as many people told me in China, once you're a farmer, you're always going to be a farmer, at least legally, as a legal definition at least, that's the case. And so um, so migrants, when they come to the cities, they don't have the city registration, and so they're often denied access to a, lots of different social services, and their kids are often denied the opportunity for education in the urban schools. And so this is sort of the key difficulty that is that's discussed right now in China, as, um, it's because it's really created sort of a two-class system. There's the official urbanites, and then there's 
the rural migrants who in many ways are treated like illegal immigrants might be um, in, in other places. And so this brings me back to the sort of theme that migrants and issues related to migration really are emerging as China's biggest domestic concern in the coming years. I think when you talk about China, it's easy to sort of throw big numbers, but when you think about 300 million people moving within the space of 20 years, that's like taking the entire population of America and asking every person to you know, leave wherever they are, go to another location, find another home, find another job. And so I think if we try to do that here, it would be utter chaos probably. <laughs> and so um, when you think about it like that, you can kind of see the, you know, the enormous challenge that, uh, p that the government faces right now and also the potential for things to go wrong at many multiple levels. I mean, I think actually things going wrong is probably the expected norm at, at some level uh, when you're talking about this. And so um, this really brings me to the idea that uh, migrants and the people that I'm writing about in the, this book really are crucial to China's future. I think how well China is able to resolve some of these difficulties and um, integrate migrants into urban life will really determine how well it's able to move to the next stage of development and also how well it's able to maintain social stability. So um, that, that, that's kind of... Um, I've heard many government leaders talking in different bureaus talking about this being sort of the key issue that they face in the coming years. So what I'd like to do now is just give you an overview of a few of the stories in the book, and then we can open it up for questions. So like I mentioned before, there's profiles of eight different migrants who have come to uh, this high-tech zone and this old village in the middle of Xi'an. And um, the book starts with a family of vegetable vendors who never actually intended to come as migrants. But um, the husband, who you see here, he was in a construction accident. He was trying to save enough money to build a small home for him and his wife right after they got married. And he was in an accident and was in the hospital for about two years and racked up medical bills of about 12,000 US dollars, which for a farmer in Western China in the 1990s was like an astronomical amount that they could never sort of hope to pay back on farming wages. And so his wife left him and their one-year-old daughter with his mother, and she moved to Xi'an to look for work to start, start saving money. And so now, um, this is about 12 years later when I was with them, and um, they're all reunited in Xi'an, and they work every day from 3 a.m. because they have to ride their bicycle across the high-tech zone to get to the wholesale market so that they can have the vegetables back to the market where they sell them at 7 a.m. So they work every day from 3 a.m. to 9 p.m. That's 18-hour days, seven days a week, 360, probably three days a year. And so, um, and they do all this really, they said, with one goal in mind, which is to make sure that their daughter doesn't have the same sort of tired life that they have and that she has more to offer to society. Then the book also has a story of 15-year-old girls who come to the city right out of middle school. So I should say that in China, there's really only nine years of compulsory education. So if you want to go to high school in China, you have to pass, pass a test, and also you have to pay. Um, so a lot of, for a lot of rural youth especially, uh, the end of ninth grade is essentially the end of their educational careers, and so they come to the cities. Or again, a lot drop out in seventh and eighth grade, unfortunately. But then they come to the cities, and um, these girls have found work in this chain of beauty, fact, uh, beauty salons, uh, which is a pretty new industry in Xi'an at that time. And this beauty salon is very good at sort of holding up a bright future that the girls can have if they you know, work hard and become managers. And they're always telling them, oh, you can have a car and a house and you can sort of become a permanent urbanite, basically. And so um, for their part, the girls are very eager to attain these dreams, but yet they feel kind of hopeless because they don't feel as poorly educated young women from the countryside, that they really have the capacity to become managers in this, this, this position. And so they live with this sort of underlying fear that if they don't sort of get their acts together and figure things out, they may, there may not be a permanent place for them in the cities, and they may end up uh, back in the village in the end. 
the the book also has a chapter about uh, the landless landlords, and these these actually are the original a family who were the original farmers in this village of Ganjaja, and they lost their land when the high tech zone uh, began. And I think to me this story is actually very important because. We hear a lot about farmers whose land is taken from them unjustly, especially last year, the whole thing in Wukan. And I think there was about a, more than 100,000 protests last year of uh, people in rural areas whose land was sort of grabbed away from them un unfairly. And so this is obviously a, a serious problem. How many protests? I think it was about 100,000 or more. Yeah, and so, um, so this is obviously a serious problem. But there's another side to the coin that I don't think we hear about very often, and that's probably because uh, if you say farmers paid well for their land, it doesn't make for great headlines. <laughs> but um, it does happen, actually. And in most of the villages that I have been to, the farmers are actually sort of eagerly awaiting for the day when the city might expand out to their village because they know that they'll most likely get more for their land than they'd ever make farming the land. And so this family, um, when, they, when the high-tech zone bought their land in the 90s, at that time in China, you didn't say millionaire, you said 10,000 air. That was sort of the mark of extreme wealth was a 10,000 air. And they received 50,000 renminbi for their land, and so they were essentially millionaires five times over. And on top of that, by renting out rooms to migrants, they made about 10,000 renminbi a month, whereas a, um, a, a software programmer in the high tech zone would make about 3,000. So financially, they were uh, very comfortable and very secure. But the problem came in, and it's not just this family, it's many families in this village had this problem that sort of they had nothing to do now, and they didn't need really to work anymore. And so idleness and addiction really set in, and, and um, especially mahjong. So this man is addicted to mahjong for the last 20 years. He told me it's his, you know, his full-time career, essentially, is, is gambling. And, um, and, and many people in that village told me that. They said, when we lost our land, everybody was sort of looking for a, a formal occupation to occupy our time. And many of us turned to mahjong, and many of us turned to Buddhism. But the most pitiful of, of us are those who didn't find anything. And so we don't really have anything to do with our time. And so this is, this is actually very common in, in these city villages. And so I think it's an important story to think about what happens to the farmers when they are actually well compensated for their land. A, a whole new set of social problems really sets in. And the book ends with the story of a 32-year-old, second grade, uh, runaway dropout who um, it was totally destitute when he was, arrived in Xi'an in the five years before I met him. But in the, the ensuing five years, he amassed a small empire of convenience stores and restaurants and um, fitness centers. And um, although he's really sort of blown past all the obstacles that would typically be in a migrant's path, he finds himself more lonely and isolated than he ever was as a poor man. And he really longs to do um, turn his sight away from himself and do um, some sort of philanthropy work. And, um, but he doesn't tell anybody this because he fears that nobody will really understand this longing in his heart. And they'll just say, you know, stop being silly, keep working, keep making money. And um, so this story I, I found really compelling, not just because it's the sort of rags to riches story, but because I think it's really indicative of the direction that modern China is headed. When China um, you know, started its reform and opening, there was generally this concept that first you have to focus on uh, m becoming materially sort of grounded, and then you can think about other things. So anything besides sort of thinking about your material um, prosperity was sort of seen as a distraction. Uh, but nowadays, you know, that, China has changed a lot in the last 30 years, and there are a lot of people who sort of have, um, you know, meet or even exceeded the sort of material goals they set for themselves. And so you see a restlessness setting in, and people are looking for, you know, what, what else is sort of to direct their attention to. And so things that previously were seen as distractions, like religion or social activism, environmentalism, uh, philanthropy, all of these things are really on the rise in China now. And so I think that although most migrants won't become as successful as this man became. I mean, most urbanites won't actually even become as successful as he became, um, although this is back in his village with his mother, so you don't get a feeling for how successful he is here. But uh, most people won't become as successful as he is. But, you know, right now the GDP in China is uh, essentially it's doubling every seven years. And so everybody's life is seeing improvements. Everybody is seeing a change in their standard of living. And so I think that at some point these migrants who have sort of 
blindly pressed ahead, eating bitterness for so long, at some point they're going to stop and sort of reassess this and want more out of life and want more out of their labor. And I mean, you see this already with the younger migrants. You see they want shorter hours and better conditions and more benefits and closer to home. And so this is really a challenge, I think, to China because the development model that's really relied on in the last 30 years is sort of not just, um, you know, it, it's really dependent on um, people being willing to endure whatever conditions there were and not really have too many expectations. And so um, that's where the book ends, and that's essentially where I'd like to end tonight. Um, I would say that the book obviously it appeals to anybody who's interested in China or development, migration, urbanization, social transformation, but it's also, even if you didn't happen to be interested in any of those things, which I think probably everyone here is interested in, but if you didn't happen to be interested in those topics, I think at its heart it's really also a human interest story because you know the term eating bitterness is a Chinese word, but it's not an exclusively Chinese quality. This ability, you know, the human being's ability to triumph in the face of seemingly insurmountable obstacles is, is, is we've seen that over and over in history. And so I think that these stories, in essence, really are about that quality. Um, so I'll, I'll end there, and then maybe we can open it up to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was wonderful, I thought. We will open it up to questions, but I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and ask the first one. In the book, your portraits <coughs> excuse me, of these people certainly shows how difficult their lives are. But there's an extraordinary optimism. And even in The Knife Sharpener, who you didn't profile this evening, this man who makes his living going around on a bicycle sharpening knives, it's not an easy way to make a living, there's an optimism. There's a sense of, we're going to triumph. Yet, on the other hand, you said, and we all have the sense that there is an eruption coming if the leadership doesn't figure out how to balance the high-tech zone and the Fanjia mm -hmm. that dichotomy. But if people are optimistic and content in a way with their lives, is there reason to think that there's an explosion brewing? That's a good question. I think that there's sort of both things happening at once. So there's an optimism. People are definitely seeing improvements in their life and the quality of life. Um, even in the rural areas, there's been a lot of improvements recently. So there's definitely an optimism that things are getting better, that the next generation you know, will uh, be, have more access to education and all of these things. But at the same time, there's also... Um, there's also been a lot of protests, this very small time, but among migrants, for example, about the fact that their kids can't have education in the cities, or that the migrant schools have been closed down, or um, you know that they're not paid on time. There's lots of sort of things on a small time scale that are brewing. I, I don't know, you know, if those protests would ever sort of coalesce into a wide scale movement. Um, I don't know if anybody knows that, <laughs> um, but. But definitely, I think there's both things happening. But I think over, overall, the sense that I got from people is that they have a lot of difficulties, but um, they do feel that sort of optimism about themselves and, and where they were headed. Except for maybe the knife sharpener, who felt like he was a dinosaur who was gradually going extinct, and there's not really that type of person uh, on the streets in, in China Someone anymore. Someone who dropped out of school after a week in first grade. Yes. Yes. So one hopes that there aren't too many That's like right, that. That's right, yeah. Questions? Go ahead. Why don't you identify yourself and then ask your question? Sorry? Identify yourself, oh, please, okay. and then ask. Oh, okay, my name is John McCann. I've, uh, uh, I went to SOAS and uh, worked with Dr. Wong Tao on um, archaeology in China, which is a really amazing field. It's changing our history of the way we look at, uh, I mean, it's literally changing by the month, mm -hmm. like everything. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but 
now I'm, I'm sort of turning my interest at, after the um, earthquake there to ideas of philanthropy and, and geos and also to the idea of, of religion seems to be something that is kind of sort of on, on the radar screen and philanthropy by things other than the government. And how do you see that as um, becoming a force for good and for sort of balancing this coming, you know, you know, possible catastrophe of things don't work out? I mean, like there's a lot of wealthy uh, people now that are, I mean, they're investing in art. You know, art the art world is booming. Mainlanders, if you go to the auction houses here in New York, it's all mainlanders buying um, things with high uh, provenance from the U.S. Or from, from here and taking it back to the mainland. And so I'm just wondering if philanthropy is, is a um, something that, that would be, say, of interest to teach. Uh, I mean, Americans really have built up wonderful philanthropy as opposed to England wants, the UK wants to use our style and model. They just can't get it together because mm. their class system is still so embedded and all that. So. That's a difficult question, so I'm not, I, you know, I'll, I'll just, uh, sorry, I mean, no, that's okay. I, basically, philanthropy in general. Sure, so. Sort of a, you mentioned that that was something that's right. growing and has possibilities. Yeah. I, individuals. Right. I think it's definitely growing among some segments of the population. So again, like this man who wanted to be in philanthropy, he didn't actually want to tell anybody because he didn't think that yeah. they could understand that. But there are definitely pockets of people, and I think young people, um, you, you know, you see a lot more interest in environmentalism and all these things among the young people. Um, I think originally you had asked if that could sort of be useful in helping to stave off some sort of uh, calamity. Um, I, you know, I think it, it's possible that, you know, if people are only focused on their material well-being and then something happens and the economy collapses or something, then obviously um, they're going to be extremely upset if that's the only thing they've sort of put their hopes on. So I think as people turn outward to more and more um, different outlets for meaning, that, that obviously if something happens financially, perhaps, again, just perhaps, that that could sort of help um, people to, to be at peace. Okay. Oh, what's wrong with China Ace Fund? I want to ask you uh, to comment uh, later if you could about this massive movement during the Chinese New Year time from <laughs> back to the rural. And right. how, how would you uh, kind of uh, help us understand a little bit of, of that kind of chaotic situation? Would that be improving? Uh, I think also uh, with uh, Foxconn now moving their factory from you know, the uh, coastal area into yes. the inland, would that help to uh, kind of uh, reduce the movement uh, of, and also getting closer to, to those who are actually uh, right. in the inland to their homes so they don't really have to uh, go to find work very far? Yeah, that's that's exactly what's happening. So Eastern China, because it's been developing for um, longer than Western China, the cost of living there is getting pretty prohibitively high in, in lots of ways, and migrants are sort of reluctant to go there um, these days. And also the, the rural areas and the townships surrounding rural areas are developing quickly, and the, the standard of living is growing in those places as well. And so migrants are starting to not really be as willing as before to go so far, um, to, to go to the east to look for work. And, and factories also, because the labor costs there now are rising, it doesn't make as much sense for them to be in the, the east. And so you do see this sort of shift. So I think it's interesting because places like Xi'an, western China, are really, it's really sort of the ancient face of China, but it's also sort of the new face of China now. So you definitely see that shift, and I think that that is definitely helping with migration. I mean, migration will still exist, but instead of people being, you know, 2,000 miles away, they might be 200 miles away. And so then in terms of your first question about the Spring Festival, 
um, I, I don't know, you know, if you, you follow that, but during Spring Festival every year, there's you know these millions, not millions, hundreds of millions of people who are going back to visit their families. And for most migrants, that's usually the only time they go back to visit their families. And so, um, trying to get a train ticket or things like that can be very difficult. And um, then every year after the festival is over, there's this sort of panic and crisis because a lot of migrants don't come back right away and so then the factories and the companies have this huge labor shortage and so um, I'm sure it's an issue that that um, many people in China would like to resolve so I think this this moving of, of things westward will, will in some degree at least help with that. Yeah, go ahead. My name is Ben Moore. Um, I, I'm sure the title of the book, and a lot of what we see in the pictures and heard your descriptions, it, it seems to be about bitterness, and yet you've described a very upbeat tone in these people. And I think a lot of books that are, are about subjects like this assume there's a problem and imply there's a fix, maybe with maybe describing it, or maybe not. But do, do you have two or three bullet points you could offer us that you, could, could you more succinctly state the problem and the fix as you see it? So I would say the problem is there's all of these, these people moving to the cities, and in the cities they face um, discrimination, they lack access to social services, and they're because of this household registration system, they're sort of treated as um, illegal urban residents in a certain way, although they wouldn't be arrested or anything like that. So that would be the problem. The, the fix, um, I personally don't have all the fixes, but I, I know some of the things that the government is trying to do. One is to expand the education system. So that's a that's a, a huge one right there. If you can allow more people to enter the education system, then um, you can have more highly skilled workers who can do other sorts of things. Um, so that's that's one big thing. And already in the last uh, the last uh, ten years, China has sort of rapidly expanded its education system. So in the 90s only about 4% of people could go to college, and today it's about 25%. So that's a, a really significant improvement. Uh, the, sa the same sort of statistics in terms of going to high school. So that's one thing that they're really trying to focus on. Um, the other sort of obvious one would be this household registration system. And um, there's lots of talk about trying to get rid of that. And there's been lots of pilots uh, around China. Uh, there's been a couple of sort of things that happen when they when they try to offer benefits well, that just came on okay when they offer benefits to the the rural people in the city so one is that those cities who did that they some of them went bankrupt pretty quickly because now they have to pay for benefits for a lot more people than they were sort of prepared to the other thing that's happened in some cities is that so for example in western china i forget if it's Chongqing or Chengdu, but they had a, a, a project where they basically have a policy that they want to allow 10 million migrants to change in their rural registration for a city registration. And in the first uh, year of that project, they had just, you know, very low people, very low number of people taking them up on this offer. And um, that's really in correspondence with the type of thing I heard people say when I was doing my research that. Um, because your rural residency is what allows you to have that piece of land back in the village. And if you trade in your rural residency for your urban residency, you lose your land. And so a lot of people said to me, if I, if I give up my land for the benefits of urban life, but all I have as a skill really is the, my body, you know? At some point my body is going to get old, it's going to break down, and what will I do to support my life in a city then? I don't have really anything to offer. and so. They don't want to trade in that piece of land because that's that that's what they essentially all plan to do. Is at some point in the future, when there's not really anything left for them to do in the city, they plan to go back to the village where they have a land, they have a home, and so so this is really a quandary for China because um, they sort of have pressure to get rid of this system, and yet the people who everybody wants to sort of help aren't really sort of willing participants in getting rid of rid of the system yet. So. Well, I don't. I don't actually know like uh, factory workers and, and things. But I, like most migrants who are doing their own business, they're sort of part of the informal economy. And you know, the man who sharpens knives isn't going to claim anything. Um, but, but I don't think they make don't, enough to yeah. qualify for the personal income tax. Yeah, I think it's way higher than what. But, 
Yeah. yeah. These people speak on those. Yeah. Jen? I was asking the question, but just that's part of the problem. They're not paying taxes, but they're in the cities. They require mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. Sanitation is a big problem. Education, etc. So it exacerbates the problem of their living. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions. Most answers. Just one. Because <laughs> there are a lot of other hands. Um, oh, you're talking about the, this mass migration. So villages being depleted of their population, mostly the able-bodied, the young, yes. the people who do do whatever farming is left or keep the city running. So are they concerned that when they do want to go back 10, 20, 30 years later to retire to this plot of land that they own, that there won't be either any people or any systems there to sustain the village they knew when they left? Uh, well, because they still technically own the land, so most migrants, when they leave, they either have a family member uh, take care of that land for them, um, or sometimes you can sort of pay someone, you essentially rent your land out. Um, so I think when they go back, they'll still have that piece of land, at least, um, which will sort of be there. But it's like these American cities in the Midwest that are emptying out for a variety of reasons, and they become ghost towns. Yeah. Yes, that's actually the topic they want to write on for the next book. Is these these ghost villages where essentially there's, you know, everybody's either under age seventeen or over age fifty five. Yeah, it's I don't know what will happen in those places as people keep going back when they, if and when they do actually go back uh, in the future. And also there's the whole issue that the younger generation who grew up in the villages still the parents or the grandparents they didn't really ever let them do farm work because they wanted them really to focus on their studies so I often think well nobody's going to even know how to, to farm it, it, at, at some point in the future it seems but in the back yeah. my name is Mm -hmm. um, and the, the question is that um, we know that if we look at the studies of public intellectuals like Qing Hui or the, um, the NGO work of uh, leftist intellectuals like Wen Jun, that there's always been sort of this, this drive to, for the, uh, to overcome the, the discrimination even in the policy, the industrial policy, which takes sub resources um, and food from the countryside to subsidize the cities, which has always been in place since 1949. Mm -hmm. It's called Jian Dao the scissor difference, right? The scissor differential. So given that, do you think that what you said about um, there being so little land, right, that it's not really sustainable for most of these farmers, if they had the ability to form cooperatives, if they can collectively bargain, which they currently do not have for the food that they produce, we would still have such a massive problem as has been pointed out, um, you know, before about the empty villages. I think it would still exist um, because there's just too many people with, with mechanized agriculture, there's just too many people in the countryside. And so even if they could kind of collectively bargain, there's just, you need fewer farmers so that each farmer can make more money. And so I think first you have to get a, sort of a big portion of the people out of the countryside. And then those who remain, I think those kind of strategies could work well. But right now, if you have 700 million people there, I, it just they're not going to be able to make enough money to make to make it sustainable. Yeah. Hi, my name is Josephine Lau. I'm a law student at Yale, and I also study Chinese politics at the University where I just met Michelle. Okay. Um, my question is more to do with kind of the respect, the writing, and some of the conversations that you've been having surrounding this book. I think um, in the last few months, there's been a lot of attention on labor issues in China, on migrant workers, factory workers, between the Foxconn suicides, the New York Times coverage um, of Apple and the labor practices in China, the Mike Daisy incident and NPRs. I think there's been a lot of attention focused right. on these issues. And I think as some, um, a few other people have mentioned, I found that I think a lot of those accounts coming out from the West and Perhaps epitomized by Mike Daisy's play 
is really portraying one side of that story. It's very, mm -hmm. very sort of more you know, one side of the account of the oppressed factory worker, um, which I think is obviously part of that story. But I think what's really struck me about your book is that it is a, um, there's a lot of optimism in it, as um, I think a gentleman had mentioned. So I'm wondering how, um, and I think that this is something that Leslie Chang has recently talked about in her editorial about how um, I think there's more complexity to the story of migrant workers as a lot of these Western accounts do, do give credit for. So I'm wondering if you have any interesting thoughts to share based on the perception or conversations that you've had touring your book around the US or you know, any thoughts you have about reporting on these stories as a Western reporter and what was important to you about the kinds of stories that you chose to bring to light. And if that's not too many questions, I'd also be curious, um, as a local reporter, you know, um, how you were able to really get into the heads of these people. You know, when I can imagine that you know, if there, there's of course a certain distance right. between someone who dropped out after one week of first grade, right. and yet yeah, you were able to collect all these amazing stories and anecdotes. So it would be great to, to hear about that. Okay, so in terms of the whole, um, the way that sort of migrants and labor issues are often portrayed, yeah, I, I find it frustrating sometimes because I really do feel that um, oftentimes it's sort of the Western perspective looking at what's happening in China, but I don't feel that migrant workers themselves, they view their reality in that way. So uh, when the Foxconn thing happened, there was a lot of reports I saw where they're really saying that, you know, that it's essentially slave labor in China. And I, I didn't find that that was really, f that kind of depiction is really fair because, um, you know, a lot of the people that I write about, they're self-employed, and yet they themselves choose to live almost exactly like most of those fi migrant workers. So um, the, the family of vegetable vendors, they live in what's essentially a one-car garage with no windows, uh, no plumbing, no water. When they eat, they turn a crate on its side uh, as a makeshift table because they don't have enough space. And so, and, and you know, I talked about they work 18-hour days, and, and they, so they essentially they work in very similar conditions um, as as the the workers in factories. And I think that um, my assumption when I went in, when I would see how people are living, I thought, oh well, they're just totally destitute. You know, they're they're just you know almost, you know, starving or something. That's why they're living like this. And as I got to know people, I found that's absolutely not the case generally. I mean, generally, um, the, it's hard to imagine, I think, in America where the savings rate, I think, is negative. <laughs> but in China, people tend to live well below their means. It's not even at their means. It's just well below their means. And so the savings rate in general in China, I think, is around 30 percent. But for migrants, they, they try to get as close to 100 percent as they can, really. Um, and so... You know, there's another story, uh, this family that they own a sheet shop and they live in the back of the sheet shop, uh, four people in the, the, just a bed in a, in a TV essentially. And again, I kind of assumed that they were destitute and it turns out that they built this mansion back in their village and um, but they, they said, but we can't live there because there's no work in the village. But you know, it's sort of, they have that and they, they've been saving money all these years. And so I think that um, it's hard for people to understand maybe in the West that people are willing to live like this because they want to save for the future. And so even factory workers, from what I understand, a lot of times when factories sort of try to improve the conditions and cut back on overtime, the workers quit because they're out there expressly for the purpose of making money. And you know they're willing to go to a factory that might have worse conditions and longer hours so that they can make more money. And so I think that it's sort of important to, to look at it through um, the perspective of the people who are living it. And so that's why when I wrote this, I made the decision to write in third person rather than first person, because I felt that a lot of uh, books by Western journalists are usually see, about China tend to be written in first person. And just by nature of the way it is in China, as a foreigner there, you become the sort of center of attention, and then the, the story kind of becomes about you. And so that, that was my decision I made in the beginning, and that was very challenging because, of course, all the people I talked with, uh, they were very interested in me. And so they always were asking me the questions. And so it really took a sort of a, a long time with each person, sort of getting them used to me, letting them ask all their questions. And, um, and so that was a, a whole process in itself. And, and the way I met a lot of these people, I mean, some of them I knew. So for example, the vegetable vendors, I had bought my produce from them for about four years when I lived in this area. But of course, I never really talked to them more than just What's the price of cucumbers today? You know, but um, I think I was also f fortunate because in China, 
you really find that almost everybody has some sort of amazing life story, and they've had you know so many difficulties and struggles, and yet sort of triumphs. And so, um, so some of the people were people that I had already known, and then some of the people I you know I sort of had a general idea of the types of people that I wanted to write about because I wanted to show the sort of spectrum of different options and different um, avenues and different obstacles that people have. And so, for example, the the um, the girls who work in the beauty salon, they sort of came up to me in the street and handed me out a free massage coupon. And they were, I knew I wanted to write about 15 year olds who came from, you know, right out of middle school. And they sort of just dragged me into their shop and it was, it was perfect. Um, the hardest one actually was this old man who was the knife sharpener because I knew that I wanted to write about um, this type of person, an older man who does some sort of small time entrepreneurial work off of a bicycle because you see a lot of those type of people in Xi'an at that time. And um, I should say at this time I was pregnant when I was doing this research and um, my husband was still in America and my insurance was still in America so I had to come back to the States to have my daughter and so you know you can't fly after about seven months of pregnancy so that gave me sort of a very clear deadline of when I had to finish these interviews. And I did. I had finished them all with about two weeks to go, except for this chapter about uh, an older man on a bicycle. And the problem was is that you know, they didn't have a stable work location. So I, I would meet somebody, and we would agree to do it. But they never had a cell phone, and they didn't have a stable work location. And so invariably, the next day, they would never show up at the time and place that we agreed to meet. And so I started to get really nervous, because I had to leave in two weeks. And so eventually, this this uh, gentleman who was sharpening knives walked by as I was waiting one morning for a, another person who didn't show up. And so I just sort of started following him around and you know, really kept stressing, you really have to show up again tomorrow, promise me. And you know, he promised me, but he didn't show up. But he had mentioned the previous day um, approximately where he lived and what time he came out. And because he has a megaphone, the way he lets people know that he's sharpening knives is he has this megaphone that blares. And so I just stood around that area and waited till I heard the megaphone, and I could track him down that way. And so, so that was uh, sort of the hardest chapter in terms of, of uh, finding the people. And um, but otherwise, it was pretty easy. We've actually gone over time, but there's somebody who's very eager to ask one more question. Do we have time for that? Sure. Okay. Okay. I'll have a very quick question. My okay. name is Zhao Gan from Columbia University. So it's been the, over 30 years since the one-child policy was introduced in China. And now one of the biggest problems is really the aging of the population. The majority of people are in the 40s. So in 20 years, you know, the majority of people are in the 60s and 70s. So the working population is shrinking. Yes. Is, what is the government doing regarding to the urban migrants or even the rural people? Uh, what I heard is that the government is loosening up on it, that if mm -hmm. they have the first child as daughter, they can have the second child until they have had a son or something like that. And uh, if you are from a one-child family, if you marry another child, one child family you can have two children. Yes. Is that? Yeah, that's the right. Yeah. So in, in the, the thing with the, um, in, it's in the, so if you're, yeah, if you're both only children, you can have a second child. And if you're from the countryside and you have the first child a daughter, then you're allowed to have a second child. Um, so yeah, there's, so they're doing things like that to sort of loosen it up. All right, I am sorry we have to draw this to a close. I think it's been wonderful. There are copies of the book available, so please buy one or two or three <laughs> for all your friends. And join me in thanking Michelle for a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.